Welcome to the exercise. The exercise can be downloaded from GitHub. Just clone the repository and you have a data set and you have an R markdown script there with lots of text and so on. So the idea with this exercise is that we will go through the six steps that we talked about in the presentation. So I load the libraries, the data set, clean it and so on. And in the end, what we have is a data frame consisting of two variables, effort and language. We have 81 rows in our data frame. So the first thing we should start think about is the likelihood. So what does our outcome effort, which is the number of hours spent in a software project? Well, it's, it's a count. It goes from zero to infinity. It would imply a Poisson process, right? A Poisson uh, distribution. Uh, one of the assumptions of the Poisson distribution is that the variance should be equal to the mean, or at least approximately equal, which it definitely is not in this case. So we'll fall back to the next maximum entropy distribution, which is the negative binomial or the gamma Poisson. And the difference is that here in the gamma Poisson negative binomial, we will model the dispersion, the, the, the variance separately. So we'll set up a null model. And that model, we will predict effort, which we assume is distributed according to a gamma Poisson. We have two parameters, lambda, which is the mean, and phi, which is the variance. Log will be used for lambda. Why? Because we don't have all the funkiness of negative probabilities and stuff. This is a generalized linear model. So we'll have a log link. And we will estimate one parameter called alpha. That's the general overall mean of the data set. That's it. We have two parameters now, phi and alpha, that we want to estimate. But in order to do so, we need to put priors on it. For phi, we have an easy way to do that. We use an exponential one. Why? It's a real number, it must be positive. You can use Weibull, half normal, half Cauchy, and so on. For alpha, you very often see a general intercept of 0, 10. But what does that imply for us? What is a 0, 10 for us? Well, we had a log link down there, so let's sample randomly from a log normal. 0, 10. And we have a maximum value for the mean of 1 times 10 to the power of 19. That is a ridiculous amount of hours that a project would use. We could use the world's population in a project for many thousands of years. Uh, that's the size of the project we're talking about. So this is not realistic. Let's uh, get a bit more realistic. Here, we're talking about 30, 30 million. It's randomly, so it's 80 million, you have 80 million, so you have, you know, 13 million. I mean, I can definitely think about a project that has millions of hours in it, but not billions. So let's, let's keep this for now. 0, 4 is a good prior for alpha for now. So the next thing is to sample and, uh, of course, uh, check the diagnostics. We give it a data set. We tell it I have four cores in my computer. I want to run four chains. They will independently and in parallel explore the posterior. Uh, we want to use command stand as a back end. And we want to calculate, calculate the log likelihood in order to do model comparison later. So what I've done now is sent this design. Rethinking will now translate it to Stan. Stan will take that, compile it, and sample. And voila, there you have it. You'll get some warnings, but there's nothing to care about here. So we can check some diagnostics. One diagnostics we should have seen already if it would have failed here, uh, divergences. We don't have any, which is an indication that uh, our chains have explored the posterior fairly well at least. But we can also look at the other diagnostics that we've talked about in the presentation. R hat is below 1.01. .01. Effective sample size is above some hundreds. 
Here it's above 1000. We can look at Trank plots. And this is how they should look like, like a big mess. Uh, if you see one of the chains diverging, um, that straying away, then you have some problems. But this is how it looks like, a big mess of colors. And we see that the estimated mean of our data set is 8.52, but we used a log. So we need to kick this back through the exponential to get it on the outcome of hours. So approximately 5,000 hours is the mean. And then, of course, we have the credible interval here, the 95%. So you can calculate that also if you want to just push that through the exponential. The next uh, logical step would be to go through a posterior predictive checks, but we won't do that because we have a, just a grand mean. So instead, let's create a new model. Instead of having a grand mean alpha, we will now have a mean estimated for each language. We will have a varying intercept model. And we will set the prior to 0, 03. Why? Because I've done prior predictive checks, of course. So the same applies here. It translates this to stand code. Stan takes this, compiles it, and then it samples from that model. And once it's done it, we get some warnings again. Uh, we can check diagnostics again. And you see R hat is okay, effective sample size is okay. If you look at the trend plots, you will see the same. But what's important here is that we see that the mean differs between the languages. So there's no question that language three, language three has the lowest mean, the lowest effort uh, when you use language three in a project. That's, uh, that's interesting. So we should all use language three, basically. Then we will always succeed in our projects. Well, now we can uh, do some posterior predictive checks. You should do many of them. There are many different ways to visualize your posterior, but let's use one just to simplify things here. So what we do with a posterior predictive check is what I told in the presentation, right? We, we want to compare the predictions our model make with the empirical data we have. So what you see in the plot here in the bottom right corner is on the vertical axis, you have the effort, the outcome that we're trying to predict. And then on the horizontal axis, you have all the cases, the rows in our data. And the blue dots is our empirical data, while the circle with the bar is our estimated mean with uncertainty around it. And the plus signs is the 90% credible interval. And you can see that the blue dots are within this, so it, it kind of looks okay. In some cases, we're underestimating, but you know, it's not bad. But of course, there are some a few more cases. Yeah. Could be an indication that there's something we're not capturing well enough. In particular, in the last case, you definitely see a big difference compared to what we would expect and what we have as an empirical data point. So the, the, there's an indication here that there might be things that we don't capture. But nevertheless, let's say that we now want to compare our null model with our M1 model, which is the varying intercept model, using Lou. So Lou gives us a warning here, and that's the good thing with Lou. It gives us ample warnings where something is fishy. In this case, it wasn't anything fishy. What does Lou tell us? It tells us that on the first row, we have the winner. And in this case, it's the M1. It puts all the weight on M1. So for compare, this is easily the model that we should use. But if we look at the differences in information criteria in PSIS, you will see that the difference is 11.8, but we have a difference in standard error, which is quite large also. What we could do, just to get a feeling for it, is to calculate the confidence interval. Is there a significant difference, if you will, between the two models? So we can take the difference in the information criteria, and then we can multiply it with the z-score of 1.96, which corresponds to 95%, and multiply that with the difference in standard error and you will see that it, we clearly cross zero. So this is not as clear a cut a case as compare wants to make it, that you know we should use model one. Uh, there is really not 
that big a difference between the two. Uh, which model you should use depends on your purposes, right? And, and, and a number of things. But in this case, it's not a clear cut, I would say. But we can go for model number one because model number one had varying intercepts and we had our programming languages in it. So that is interesting. So what we could do first is we could plot the output here. And what we could plot uh, is the language estimates that we have. And this is the plot we get. The circle is the mean for each language and the bars are the 89% credible interval. Now, traditionally, we might stop here and say, oh, language number three is significant. We have a winner. There's no big difference between language one and two, you could say. And the reason for that is that we have bars here that are not crossing each other. So it's significantly better on the 89% credible interval. Now, life is not that easy, right? Uh, we have omitted variable bias, so we have unknowns. Uh, we, the data set actually consists of a number of parameters that we could incorporate as predictors in our models. So that could be the next logical step to look at. Uh, but for now, let's, let's just say that uh, uh, M1 is the model that we're interested in working on. So what more can we do? Well, the beauty is that we actually have a posterior probability distribution. And if you look at a posterior probability distribution, you will see that you have samples for all our parameters. We have the phi, the dispersion component here, but then we also have for language, we have three columns, one for each language. So we could look at effect sizes. How much better is something compared to something else? So let's compare language one and two here, because uh, it might be a bit um, more interesting. So what we could do is we could take language two minus language one, and then we get the differences between the two. So what does this tell? What does that tell us? Well. This is the distribution of the differences, differences between two languages. So not only do we have a point estimate saying something about the effect size, here we have a distribution of it. We can even count how many times something is better than something else. So out of 2000 samples we have, we can say that three fourths of a time, basically uh, language number two is better and one quarter of a time, language number one is better. And of course, since you have a posterior probability distribution, you, you don't have to worry about multiple comparisons and stuff like that. Uh, it's basically up to your imagination to ask questions to the posterior. It will give you an answer always. So be careful about how you interpret that answer. But I'll leave that up to you. Thank you very much for listening.